Good evening, everyone. My name is Quentin Ring, and I am the director of Beyond Borough Community Arts Center. I am very pleased to welcome you to a celebration of Ravens and Crows, Life, Death, and Family, uh, a reading featuring Lorraine Herring and Jim Natal. Lorraine will be reading from her new book, A Constellation of Ghosts, a speculative memoir with ravens. Jim will be reading from his new poetry chapbook, Etude in the Form of a Crow. Uh, before we get to the readings, however, I did want to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. First, I'd like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. As many of you know, Beyond Baroque is a literary space in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse literary community. Beyond Baroque's programming includes readings, writing workshops, and art exhibits. At the moment, our programs are still almost entirely virtual, but we do expect to open uh, for regular in-person programs in late January 2022, which uh, we're very glad to say will be quite soon. Um, a major component of our mission involves offering workshops to writers of all levels. Uh, these include our Wednesday Night Poetry Workshop, which has been running continuously since 1969 and is currently being facilitated by the poet Joseph Rios. <clears throat> Meanwhile, our Monday Night Fiction Workshop is being taught by the writer Raquel Baker. Uh, you'll find a link to both of those uh, in the chat. Uh, we also regularly feature um, regular intensive seminars, um, multi-week classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're pretty much done with those for the year, but check back in January for our offerings in 2022. Um, I should also mention that we do have an upcoming in-person program in, co in collaboration with the art gallery LA Louvre here in Venice. Uh, that's a reading and talk featuring the Haitian Canadian writer Miriam J. Chancy and the artist Alison Saar. Uh, that program will be held at 4 p.m. on December 18th. Um, and will take place at LA Louvre in their gallery. Um, it's in conjunction with a, with a really brilliant art exhibit that's been curated by Alison Saar. Um, so we'll be an opportunity to tour the exhibit. Um, tickets for that will be released next week. So please do stay tuned for that. Um, I also want to say that we'd very much appreciate any donations you can make as part of the evening. Uh, you'll find a link in the chat uh, or on our website to make those donations. The past two years have been devastating for many, many art organizations and Beyond Baroque is no exception. Uh, we do need all the support we can get in order to reopen. Uh, so please do give whatever you can. Uh, it will directly support um, you know, what, what is Los Angeles' oldest literary institution. Um, I also want to mention a few words of thanks to our staff, uh, Jimmy Vega, uh, and particularly to Angeline Keck, um, who is uh, running the, the Zoom side of things right now. Um, this program wouldn't be possible without them. Um, and so let's go ahead and get to the program. I am uh, absolutely thrilled to have Lorraine Herring and Jim Natal here this evening. They're both reading from new work, as I mentioned earlier, and um, they're, go they're also gonna be taking some time to ask each other questions about their respective books. Um, so we should have a little bit of discussion going. Um, and then for those of you in the audience, there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, at the end of the program. Um, so if you do have questions, please, please do save those and then you can throw them in the chat, you know, um, when the time comes, right, like, as I said, right towards the end of the program. Um, so I'll just go ahead and kick things off by introducing Jim and I think then he'll say a few words about Lorraine. Uh, Jim Natal is the author of five books of poems, Memory and Rain, Talking Back to the Rocks and In the Bee, in the bee, bee Trees, as well as two collections written in contemporary high boom form, 52 Views, The High Boom Variations, uh, and Spare Room. His most recent poetry collection is the chapbook Etude in the Form of a Crow, multi-year Push, Pushcart Prize nominee, literary presenter, and co-founder of the indie publishing house Complex Press. His work has appeared in many journals and anthologies. Um, I'd also add to that, uh, Jim is a really wonderful friend to the literary community and to Beyond Baroque in particular. Um, so Jim, it's always a pleasure to host you. Uh, please, everyone, please welcome Jim Natal. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to be here and do whatever I can to support Beyond Baroque. Donate if you can. Um, so thanks to you and Beyond Baroque and Angeline I, in the background there uh, running the show. Uh, thanks to you too. And welcome to all of you out there in virtual land. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight to celebrate new books from Lorraine Herring and me and to acknowledge the crows and ravens that have starring and cameo roles in them. Uh, the format tonight 
is, uh, as, as Quentin uh, mentioned, is two rounds of Lorraine and I alternating reading and briefly conversing about our work. And to start off the evening, uh, it's my pleasure, great pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and a former colleague uh, at Yavapai College, uh, Lorraine Herring. Uh, Lorraine is the founder of Fierce Monkey Book Coaching. She's a writer, professor, and grief therapist. Her newest book, A Constellation of Ghosts, a speculative memoir with ravens, was released from Regal House in October. Among her other books are Writing Begins with the Breath, The Writing Warrior, On Being Stuck, Tapping into the Creative Power of Writer's Block, Lost Fathers, How Women Can Heal from Adolescent Father Loss, and the novels Ghost Swamp Blues and Into the Garden of Gethsemane, Georgia. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, The Rumpus, and Catapult, and has been widely anthologized. She won the Barbara Deming Award for Women for her fiction, and her nonfiction has been nominated for Pushcart Prize. And she does a lot more than just write, as if that's just writing. Lorraine has been on the Arizona Artists roster. She's taught nationally at the Kirpalu Center for Yoga and Health, the Omega Institute, the Antioch Writers Workshop, ASU's Desert Nights Rising Stars, and the Tucson Book Festival. She's worked at Hospice of the Valley, the New Song Center for Grieving Children, Camp Paws, which is a grief camp for kids, and she's received grants to bring writing and grief workshops to women in transitional housing and women in addiction recovery. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of, of Hags on Fire, I love that name, an online zine dedicated to women's writing on perimenopause, menopause, and aging. She's a tenured professor of psychology at Yavapai College in Prescott, Arizona, and is also a private book coach. And she has lived with many, many cats, one of which is very large. Uh, please <laughs> welcome Lorraine Herring. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking time tonight to be with us. Um, the section that I'm going to start with is the actual very beginning of the memoir. Um, it is a speculative memoir, and that means, um, it means to me anyway, that the um, imagined world is every bit as relevant to the truth of a person's story than um, as the actual acts that take place. Um, and so the speculative parts of this book are um, a raven, which returns um, as sort of the ghost of my father after I get a colon cancer diagnosis in 2017. So this is the opening uh, first few pages. <clears throat> Words were your superpower. They helped you make sense of everything, but now multisyllabic words from a different vocabulary circle the sounds you understand. Vultures waiting to devour the corpse of your useless language. These new combinations of letters, cytotoxin, angiogenesis, immunohistiology, swallow the words you are familiar with in large gulps. You begin to detach from yourself. The white walls of the gastroenterologist's office collapse like a file box into black velvet corridors. You see your husband, but he can no longer see you. Your feet have been pulled to the velvet, your body stretched rubber, words bouncing off your skin. Cancer, referral, stage, malignant, surgery, now. Next, the corridors unfold into a labyrinth of rooms, stairs, doors, all brushed black velvet, devoid of sound. Your gastroenterologist is talking to you and your husband is touching your hand, but you've left them. Their mouths are moving, but the language is garbled, the bubbles of fish underwater. Without the ability to understand, you reach your hands to the walls, soft and thick and sticky. Each step pulls your enlarged body forward. The floor is a conveyor doing what it must. Once you've arrived fully in the velvet underground, new walls erect around you. The white drywall adorned with gold embossed diplomas disappears into the black fabric and the world where you came from is shut behind clear glass. You realize you've left your clothes, 
but it's too late. Your stretched rubber body bounces slowly floor to ceiling, wall to wall, your pale skin naked and electric against the dark. Your doctor gives your husband a referral to a colorectal surgeon and turns back to his computer. A shadow you remain seated in the office, calmly writing down the next steps before gathering her belongings to leave. Shadow you is making lists. Talk to your dean, find a cat sitter, tell mom, find substitutes for classes, fill out FMLA paperwork, tell. And you realize Shadow You is doing the same thing you did when you were seven and your father had a heart attack and all the grown-ups thought he would die within a year, even though they never told you that. They told you everything was fine, but your eyes saw their lies. Cleaved in half, his chest scarred, his daddiness had disintegrated into bruised cells. You broke apart then, a seven-year-old fragment watching a seven-year-old shadow self making the lists that she believed would save her. Tell extended family, write eulogy for dad, take care of mom, cry all the tears out now. It didn't work then, your tears still swim behind the decades of fine, but nonetheless, shadow you makes the lists that will overcome this crisis. Prep classes for two months, set up auto pay for credit cards, find proxies for your committees, update your will. You wonder if that girl fragment and her girl shadow ever found their way back together again, but there are now more pressing matters, such as learning new vocabulary words and finding the key and the door to leave this black velvet place. The dark labyrinth stretches behind you and the double pane sheet of glass in front of you is smooth. Shadow you is smiling, saying something to the doctor, cracking a joke perhaps, and your husband has retreated to his brain to figure out how to fix the rebellion of your colon cells. Shadow you leaves the office, credit card in hand to pay for services rendered in codes. You don't know the language of codes yet, of billing and declining and remanding, but you will. Shadow you has a string tied to her wrist that reminds you of the friendship bracelets you would make in the backyard of your North Carolina home before your father got sick, before you moved to Arizona, before he died, before you shattered and the abuser got in, before cancer. But upon closer look, the shimmering string stretches, a connective thread from her body to you in your strange velvet box, and Shadow you is pulling you and your new house behind her like a carnival balloon. You press your face to the glass, but it distorts, and the waiting room, and then the parking lot, and then your red Toyota constrict and slip farther away. Shadow you calls your dean, makes an appointment, checks an item off the list. You've been leaning on the glass, and when you back away, the imprint of your forearms forms a keyhole. A raven appears between the panes, right leg shorter than the left, a lit Pall Mall cigarette clipped in its beak. You rub your eyes. Shadow you in the passenger seat of your car is now a brush stroke in an impressionist landscape. The raven, blue, black, and iridescent, grinds its cigarette out beneath its claw and uses its beak to tap along the inside of the glass, edging your arm prints with its tick, tick, ticks. When it finishes, it pushes the cut piece of glass toward you and you jump back as it lands silently on the velvet. The raven cocks its head, its right eye finding yours and winks as it steps through the keyhole, turns back for the dead cigarette, and then hops to your bare feet. You reach your hand through the hole and touch the exterior pane, the world on the other side of it increasingly unfamiliar. You retreat and the raven fans its wings and leaps to your shoulder and its cool breath raises the hair on your still naked flesh. You have no words for this. The wind from its brief flight from floor to shoulder tugs the fabric from the walls into a shift dress, which wraps snug around you. Raven pulls a dandelion from beneath its chest feathers and tucks it behind your ear, its white fluff floating between you. I have been trapped between the glass for so long, it says. I wondered if you would ever come for me. You shiver and the dandelion drops seeds. Do you have a light, asks Raven. We might be here quite a while. Shadow Yu has now arrived at the college where she works with the copies of her colonoscopy report and the referral note. Her dean will meet with her in 20 minutes, so first she'll scan the medical records, start to keep a file and make notes of questions, things to do, things to stop doing. Look at me, not her, says Raven, 
I'm the one you've been focused on for 30 years. The bird flits quickly, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, biting at the velvet until it becomes a branch and then it perches and shrieks. I see, I see, I see from sea to shining sea that you have created quite a story for us to act within like characters in black box theaters and you have built it so that we have just three ways to end this show. I will go or you will go or we will go together. I'm the one you press between the glass like clover, thinking you could keep everything the same, stop decay and hold me hostage to your past. But daughter, I too have things to say and miles to go, but you have captured me and kept me from my death. Tell me daughter, are you so attached to me that you will die as well? Or now that you are at your crossroads, will you reconsider what you've held and toss it up and down and out so you can see from sea to shining sea what still can be? Are you ready? Shall we write a script? His unpunctuated speech unspools your throat. All you'd ever wanted was one more chance to talk with him. And so you whisper while Shadow You is filling out forms and calling your mother and researching words while her cells are eating themselves. You whisper old new words, daddy, yes, let's make a play. It will be a cast of only four, says Raven, you and me and my mother and my father. And we will speak until there are no more words between us. And then you can decide the ending. You look behind you and the walls have morphed into proscenium and arch, a wide stage draped in black velvet curtains, a single blue white spotlight aimed at the floor. Raven plucks a feather, slices at your flesh and dips it in your blood. You go first, he says, it's your story. You take the quill and start to scratch on the stage floor. The spotlight finds you, house lights dim. You pause, body stiffening. I can't, I can't write the story that contains your exit. Tick tock, tick tock, Raven says, it's my departure or yours. Daddy, Shadow You is talking to your step uncle, a doctor who is telling her about the Da Vinci machine that will cut her belly open and remove part of her colon and put her back together. Shadow You writes notes, good girl, good student, but now her hand is shaking. Tick tock, says Raven, Right. I was doing other things when cancer came and my father, 30 years dead, returned to me as a raven. Wow, thank you, Lorraine. That is that is so stunning. And that, that's the opening of the book. That's the opening. Mm -hmm. That's the first chapter. Wow. Um, well, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and I thought I'd start with the what I think is the obvious one is um, how or why, more than likely, why did you decide to use the raven figure to represent your father? Why a raven and not something else or just your father? Um, there was a, um, if y'all don't know the work of um, Ariel Gore, she's a wonderful um, writer and, and teacher. And um, she has these Saturday morning prompts that come um, that you can pay for $5. And, and one of the prompts was um, someone who is dead is not dead and they show up at your door. And that was sort of actually the prompt that began the whole book for me. And I tried to write that as I was like, oh, okay, well, what if dad showed up at my door again? Like that would be interesting. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> I couldn't have a person that made it work. Um, and I, I think I really needed that distance. And, um, and then of course, Ravens are all over Prescott where I live They're, You know, when I walked to my office at work, there are these gigantic Ravens on the trash dumpster. I mean, they're just everywhere. And it just seemed like the, and of course there's all the mythology around Raven being the, you know, being the, the, the messenger or the, you know, the carrier between the worlds and, and all of that. And it just, once I kind of got that and began to listen to what it might sound like, I wanted to kind of make a a ghostly sound to that voice that was, you know, understandable, but also a little bit off. And, and that sort of solidified it. And once I got that, I got the book, but it took a long time to get that. I had like a million wrong starts into the book until I got that. Wow. 
Uh, well, you know, and if for those who are lucky enough to read the book and uh, are smart enough to read the book, um, you that really is an amazing you know image that Lorraine carries throughout. Um, well, <clears throat> a constellation. This is more of a, a craft question. A, a constellation of ghosts uses um, a non-traditional form for a memoir. You employ theatrical references. We just heard some and techniques. To throughout as if this were a stage play instead of a book. How did you conceive of this approach to the material? I had a dream. Really? Yeah, really, really. Um, and um, just to kind of, I don't know if people can see, parts of the book are literally written like a stage play. And then there are parts that are, you know, just like a regular lyric, you know, like a regular lyric essay. And, um, I, I didn't know at the beginning, but I wanted to um, bring within myself a, a unification of this is the rational analytical part of me. This is what, what happened. This is this life. But I've always had such a imaginative, such a rich inner landscape and imaginative world. But I've always kind of been told that that's like not real. And I think part of the personal healing for me with even writing this book was accepting that that was also real because not that I'm not saying my father literally showed up in the backyard as a, as a raven, like I <clears throat> imagined that, but, it, but, but the imagining of that allowed for a deeper access to the truth of what it was that I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I wanted to have two separate formats so that I could merge them together at the end to also visually represent that. And then I also wanted in the speculative part, which was the, which is the raven part, his mother and father, I wanted that to be so easy to identify. I think that's really important with speculative memoir that you're clear with the audience. Okay, this is now where you're going into this world instead of, you know, I don't think you should be tricking people in that way. Um, and, and that just made it really easy to focus just on dialogue because they were also ghosts. So to have them, you know, being corporeal and being, you know, all of that just wasn't working for what I wanted to be able to do. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Jim is going to read some of his amazing work um, from his collection. And Quentin read the introduction that I was going to share with you all for him. So I'll say this other thing that he doesn't know I'm going to say, which uh -oh. is <laughs> so it's like, oh no, um, which is Jim used to live in Prescott where I live now. And um, and he made such a kind and compassionate effort to come to the college and set up this amazing literary series that he's been running now for many, many years, even after he left us and moved back to the beach, because I guess, you know, beach. And so, um, so um, he has been such a, such a kind, positive, constant influence in my life, not just through his writing, but through his friendship. And it's just really a pleasure to be able to introduce you in that way. So I'm glad Quentin read the other part. Yeah. Well, gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I can't, I can't read now. Yes, you can. Okay, I can. Well, all the poems that I'll be reading tonight are including included in my new chapbook from Conflux Press uh, called Etude in the Form of a Crow. Um, it will be available uh, later this month. I'm going to read tonight from the uh, from this the proof copy of the book um, for a variety of reasons. It's uh, running a little late, uh, but that's uh, perhaps COVID might have something to do with it. Uh, anyway, this is uh, the book, and um, you can order copies directly from me via email uh, or through my website jimnatel.com or from confluxpress.com the publisher, uh, and Beyond Baroque Bookstore uh, will also have uh, copies in hand. I'm going to start off with um, a poem that kind of began it all called Early Morning Crow. Crows have no shame. They call at 6 a.m., expect a response from windows reflecting overcast skies wait for an echo to return across the canyon, for the bottle to wash up on the shore, the telephone to ring, the empty half of the bed to fill. 
You cannot throw a boot at them like sex struck cartoon cats yowling backlit by the moon. Cannot chew them like pie faced pasture cows ruminating with the intensity of low watt bulbs. The crows wake you, then they leave. And there you are, an overdue bill overripe melon, alone with your thoughts sluicing back through the gates you had to lower by hand the night before, cranking rusty wheels and cogs so you could get some sleep. The bed floods and you rise, afloat with black wings spread like oil upon the surface, a near fatality the cold almost got wet through and hearing a solitary crow that asks, is anybody there? Is anybody there? But flies away before you can form any suitable answer. Uh, this next poem uh, is called Birthright. You'd think I was Esau, the amount of hair I lose, but not his coarse, dark, bestial kink. No, these birthrights of mine are fine and silver as a crescent moon scything a clear night sky, like my father's hair in his age. Or maybe a few I find are my father's, Carrot and keepsakes lost in the back of a drawer, like heirlooms pressed beneath locket glass, miniature sheaves, barren stalks, and leafless stems, or hair wrapped amulets, tightly bound bundles offered on carved bodies of fetish animals to help speed the dead, protect them on their way or the eminently dying, young yanking tufts painlessly from their scalps, exposing creases, shapes of skulls for the first time since birth, light, air, hair falling more insidious than mist that dampens your overcoat, chills you to the bone by the end of the night, perched there, becoming heavy on your shoulders like Odin's ravens, Hugin and Munin, thought and memory, who fly out each morning and return with news of the realm, that it's crumbling, toppled pillars swept into drifts on a white tiled floor, or like snow along treacherous downhill grades, unplowed highways, mounded and obscuring the markers, making mountains appear more distant. Or these hairs of mine, of yours, hollow shafts under a microscope with bark like junipers, or trunks strewn after an eruption, a meteor strike that laid end to end would reach back into time, my father's words, hurtful prophecies that now cannot be traded for a bowl of anything. Words parted and worn on the outside, like my, like his thinning silver hair, or carried within, inevitable and patient as a gene. Uh, I'll conclude this first set with a section from uh, Rain in L.A., <clears throat> which is one of uh, the two sequences that uh, bookend my collection, Memory and Rain. This is the rain part of it. Um, the whole sequence, uh, sequence integrates um, many references to movies and songs. And this one features uh, excerpts of lyrics from Chicago blues and goes back to a winter here in L.A., when it just wouldn't stop raining. Imagine that here, huh? It's called Rain in LA, Friday Dawn. The crows are up early, 
already yakking to themselves and anything within earshot. Winged lunatics in black trench coats, breaking twigs off the wet, not yet budding branches with ebony nutcracker beaks. Even they, irritating, troubling in their recent profusion, make nests. I should know better than to listen to blues on a stormy morning, grayer than a south side Chicago back porch. I should know a lot of things. The eagle flies on Friday, the song goes, except here, still out of work and scrambling, burning both ends to make the middle meet while countless government billions gush, pelt foreign cities with bombs and hot lead. Oh yeah, blues is my business and business is good. In my version of LA, Everything is as the crow flies, seeking a dead reckoning. I'm so broke right now, I can't even spend the night. The red kettle on the stove spits and sizzles. The grinder whines. I ordered coffee, but the blues poured me misery. I pour extra grounds into the paper cone. Forget caffeine, staying up is not the problem, nor is hearing the hiss of the building sprinklers coming on at 4 a.m. Timer oblivious to hours, days of soaking, the sated lawn regurgitating while I feel like I'm drowning on dry land. Driver's doors open, latch closed, the ignition of first risers leaving for jobs in near dark. Even then the freeways won't be free. All this anger welling, somebody's got to suffer. Somebody sure got to feel some pain. I wish I could ring screeching blues out of the neck of some nickname guitar, amp sparking, short circuiting in this everlasting downpour, pissed off neighbors raising windows, hollering, you better be careful out in that rain or you may wash your life away. So cool to hear you read them out loud, especially <laughs> that one with, with the, yeah. With the, I wish I could sing. Oh, me too, I know, me too, me too. Um, so. I, I wrote thematic questions for you. Okay. Um, and so these three poems, I, I, kept, I kept seeing the, the painting the scream in the background <laughs> of them, you know, it was this, they, just, they just spoke so clearly of, um, of that existential dread that seems so prevalent in the last few years, four, five, and then especially last year. Um, and that, that kind of suffering that just is, is relentless and has that really dark sense of humor connected to it as well. Um, and so I wondered about the ravens and crows in these poems and if they helped you address that existential suffering within yourself mm -hmm. um, and or if you don't want to do that one, did the writing of the poems help you address that suffering? Well, I think the writing of poems helps all the time with everything, you know, it gets it out. And, uh, you know, and I think, I think, you know, you can write dark stuff and not be totally depressed. Totally. Yes. I mean, you know, I mean, I, somebody, maybe some people out there have heard me say one time I was writing this poem in the early morning and my wife, Tanya came in and, uh, I said, Oh, you got to hear this poem. And so I read to her and, you know, it was a really dark one. And she goes, how can you write such dark shit first thing in the morning? You know, and it's, but I felt great. You know, I was yeah, really, yeah. Um, as for the crows and ravens being involved, I just, you know, they're around so much. There's such a mm -hmm. presence here. Yeah. As you mentioned in Prescott and here too, you'll hear in these, these other poems I read too, they're, they're just here. And um, I don't, I don't always think of them as um, kind of mythological presences and, and, and portents and, and so on. 
the, but I just think they're remarkable birds. And, and, and I think it's even cooler that they have all those associations with them. And in the, in the chat book, I wrote a long introduction detailing a lot of these associations and the history of crows and ravens and our language and, and all this stuff and how they've influenced us. And I, I, I don't think of them that way when I look at them on the street. I'm watching them, you know, tear apart McDonald's bags on right. the street and trying to find French fries. But, um, but they're there. And and they are they are around and I I, I don't know they they tend to fly through my poems. I I think that answer kind of ties into the the second question that I wrote around these, which were, um, if I was trying to group, I don't know why I felt like grouping everything together, but I was trying to group them together and see like okay these ravens and crows in these three poems seem to me to be about accountability, about like hey hey, pay attention, watch out. You know that hair that's falling, that that gene that's waiting to wake up. You're wasting your life, you know. And then they have that that sort of relentless, you know, cawing and 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 the sound that um, that can sound intriguing, can sound shaming, can sound judgmental, can sound opening, can sound like all of you know, kind of all of that put together. Um, and so, as the professor of psychology, my question for this is. Um, <laughs> Are there things that you're afraid you might be losing or not able to do anymore? Absolutely, absolutely. And I have I have poems, uh, not in, that I'll be reading tonight, but um, that deal with that specifically. In fact, I've been writing a few more of them recently. You know, I'm older, and you know, you realize that certain things. You know, I mean, any time you do something could be the last time you do it. You know, I mean, it's just part of mortality and part of things that you understand. I don't walk around thinking that, but I am aware of that. And, you know, it's just part of aging is becoming aware of mortality, especially, as you mentioned, because of what's been going on the last few years with endless wars and COVID and, and uh, you know, the political situation we all went through for four years and, um, and are still kind of going through now, you know, and, and the unrest and, and, and the uncertainty. So yes, there's there's a lot that that gets worked out, um, and um, and I think um, you know that it's just crows are not funny. They're fun to watch, and they're incredibly intelligent, but they're not fun. They they don't sing, you know. They they have the ability to recognize faces, you know. They're they're kind of facial recognition technology uh, you know in in animated form you know if you do something to a crow and it's in your neighborhood they don't forget you they'll <laughs> scream at you if they see you again so you know I, I think that they have that and i think the word you used is probably the best word they're relentless yeah. they just won't shut the fuck up <laughs> sometimes some mornings it's just like what you know yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, well, I know you you have another section to read, and I, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, this is uh, Raven. Um, so this is the the ghost of my father, or so I hoped and thought. Um, and this is the first time that this that he appears on his own in the book. So this is just a few pages past what I read before. And what um, the only thing I think you need to know to have it make sense is. Um, when I was, when my dad died, I was 19 years old and I was the only one that was in the hospital room with him. He had had another, he had had his third heart attack at that point. And my, um, uh, my mom and sister had gone home just to take a shower and he died while they were gone. And I was the one that was there in that room. And that was, a um, obviously a, a powerful moment for me. So that's referenced. I remember you, my daughter, before you were you. I watched you grow beneath my wife's belly, felt your feet kicking the walls of her womb, always running you were, always trying to get out, get away, but when you were born, you wouldn't walk. Not for three years. You sat and you crawled and you watched, and then one day you got up and walked into the next room and closed the door. That was you. And that was you in relationship to us, to your mother and me. 
We could come close, but not too close. We could watch you watching us from your playpen, but from the very beginning, you were a closed book. And I knew then what I know now, you had taken on a burden that wasn't yours. You had come into the world, not just with her eyes and jaw and my love of language and history, but you came with the ghosts that made us, us. Had we known creating a child forged a link, not just to the best of us, but to the parts of us we wanted desperately to erase, would we have made you? Would we have anchored another soul with our ghosts? Maybe that is all human creation is, a stringing together of ghosts born from one flicker of love, one sigh of release, a way of tethering us all together so that we don't get lost in the dark. You'd think I'd know these things now that I am here. I remember you watching me when I was dying. I was back in the hospital and I was in that damned pastel gown with the snaps and I wasn't conscious, but I had never been more awake. You wonder about these things. Now that you have been in the hospital, I watch you, I watch you, you, I watch. You know you're close when you feel both limp and living. Your body is asleep, but you, you begin to crackle and unfold and you never realized how big you were, how much space you could have taken up, how much of yourself you could have shared. I wanted to reach to you, but my arms were shackled to the bed because I had tried in the night, unconscious though I was, yes I was, but still the part of me that transcends me had tried to untangle myself from this body, to remove the tubes and needles and silence the relentlessly squawking machines. When you are about to burst with breadth and depth, you know it will only be a few moments and you want to resist like how you daughter wanted to resist the anesthesia before surgery, but always it is stronger. It is a tidal wave at the edge of your consciousness and you surrender to it without trying to, even if for a moment you plan to anchor your defiant feet in the shifting sand. I wanted to reach to you, but we had not been a tactile family, too much Lutheran, too much Baptist, too much discomfort with the messiness of flesh. But I knew in that final dermal moment that to touch the skin of another was to touch the face of the God I had long wrestled with. To touch the flesh of another was to hold the very miracle of the cosmos, that 98.6 degree fire threading through us all. I wanted you to touch me too, but I knew the beeping scared you, the thick restraints on my wrists, the unconscious thrashing of my body that was trying to kick loose my soul. I was breaking free of my bone cage at the same time I was reaching for you and the full moon tide was coming and I could taste the salt spray on my lips and she smelled of life and my body twisted and I tugged at my chains like a Victorian ghost, but they were not chains at all only flaccid representations of the human hope of permanence. The nurse had brought you into my room that morning alone. You were alone, only 19, 19, only alone. And she told you I was leaving and you watched like you had watched me from the moment you opened your eyes from your curl in the crib to your petulant high school pout to this instant where we found ourselves on opposite sides of the river. I watched your birth passage thrashing and bloody and dark and you watched my death slide and I wondered for a blink who was waiting for me to emerge, flesh suit shed, shimmering sparkle of dust and I wanted to bring you with me, not to take your life from you, no, but to take my very best thing with me, my daughter, my daughter, I wish so much I could have stayed, stayed, could have saved you. So I struck a bargain like Robert Johnson, song and guitar at the Delta Crossroads. Just a little bit more time, just a little bit, you see. My daughter, my daughter, she will need me soon. But the full moon tide kept rising. It's heard this song before, so much before that it has a response. Can I get an amen, amen? Can I get an amen? Who wants to be saved? I do, I do. Who wants to turn it over now? I do. I do, the tide is rising, the salt is churning, the undertow has wrapped its fingers around me and I have one second left to memorize your face. No lines yet, no lines, no gray. And I watch you swallow my tide, lapping at the muggy air in the sterile room, 
gulping your own rising tide back, squeezing your eyes closed to hold the water line at bay. You are watching me still, tossing on the bed. You are watching me slipping out behind my lips into the fluorescent room. You are watching me last gasp, death rattle, death rattle, only the shaking off of the lost tendons that held me, held me to my house, my house, my lungs, my spleen, my liver, my kidneys, my useless leg, my heart, my heart, my heart, how well you have done for all that you have suffered through, how well you have done, my daughter, my daughter, drink me in this moment, our moment, please, please, just a little more time, I come to the crossroads, I come, I come. Stunning writing, Lorraine. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to hit you up with one question that kind of turns the uh, psychologist question, uh, tables around on you. Uh, hey, it's fair. Um, how was it for you during the right, it, this writing to inhabit your father's voice, take his persona, and create those soliloquies and dialogues? Um, was this memoir a form of grief counseling for yourself? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was a way, it was a whole exercise in ancestral healing for me. Being able to embody his voice, the voice of my grandparents, who were very difficult and we had a very strange relationship with. Um, I, I really wanted to write everybody back home. Okay. Well, I will, uh, should I just jump yeah, in? Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. It's just so wonderful to hear your, your voice and your work. You. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off uh, uh, my last little couple of poems here uh, with the, uh, a poem called Animal Planet. This is the hour of hyenas, the hour of crows descending, filling the trees and scaring away the songbirds. This is the hour of the weasels, of rampant viruses, of lap dogs that bite your ankle as you walk away. Now the baboons are on the loose, slinging rocks and poop, and the wrestling bears have mauled their trainers. Zoo elephants crush keepers underfoot. Siegfried and Roy have canceled tonight's performance. It's the wrong day to wear your pet python around your neck or to feed the piranhas by hand. Even the dolphins are in an ugly mood. They really do have teeth in those beaks. Lemurs and sloths are speeding up, sharpening their long climbing claws. Prehensile tails braid tightly across the canyons. Railroad bridges undermined by moles collapse. The lemmings turn back at the lip of the cliff and beavers chew pines to block routes of escape. Gangs of gulls clog airport runways while winged tornadoes of flies, mosquitoes, wasps, and bees writhe through lowering air. Listen, locusts are humming something uber alles? And from the way they're waddling, the marsupials are packing some serious heat in those pouches. This is no stroll in the woods anymore, picnic in the park, day at the beach. It's a jungle out there. Just ask the wolves, fleas and lice, gators, sharks, Buzzards, scorpions, spiders, rats, and bats. Is it time, Mr. Darwin? Is it time? And I'm going to finish with this poem that takes its title and inspiration uh, from a sign I saw one day on a walk in uh, Marina del Rey. Uh, it's called Lost One Footed Adult Crow Reward. Maybe it should have said free instead of lost. 
Maybe it's the same crow I hear down the block, puncturing the morning with insistent counterpoint to the soap smooth cooing of Sunday doves. And lost to whom? One creature's lost is another's escape. But now that it's back among the power lines and madrona trees, this crow really could be adrift, homeless and dressed in shabby black, roosting in doorways wrapped in atrophied wings. There's the obvious question of how the crow lost its foot. What led to its pet name of Hopalong, Long John, or perhaps Lefty? Did it happen when it was young or grown? Or was it born that way, its whole life a balancing act? Crows are so smart, curiosity or boredom could have gotten the better of it. And with sharp edged suddenness, the idea of spending its maturity in someone's care became more necessary than ludicrous. Kind words, a guaranteed ear, the certainty of scheduled meals, a place to sleep with both eyes closed. And about that reward, if the crow is returned, accepts again its cage and perch, or even comes back on its own to claim its low ceiling kingdom, will it be win-win all around? The owner regains a live-in jester. The crow can relax, take a load off its foot, and the alert, good-hearted Samaritan, who at first refused the crisp 20, now slips it in with the other bills on the way down the back stairs. It's almost like one of those Asian teaching tales, how the unfortunate open window leads in as well as out. Thank you so much. You answered one of my questions, which was, was I figured there was a sign. You must have seen a sign for that. It was just too late. <laughs> it was too LA. It was just I like that. A, to I be. actually have a photo of it, you know? So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So my thematic grouping for these was around um, domain and whose domain is whose and what happens when creatures break out of and or take over other domains. Um, and kind of what is the cost of the illusion of a space that is ours um, was, was what sort of bubbled to the surface for me. And so the, the psychological question here is, um, do you think that we are slipping back into our cages as humans, or do you think we are making any forward progress at all? I don't think we're going to have much of a cage left to slip yeah. back, to tell you the truth. Um, with, you know, and it, from everything I see, with people not being government leaders and, and corporations and so on, uh, still uh, favoring greed and, uh, and making money over saving the planet. Uh, they're not gonna have a place left to, uh, to spend their money on. Um, so yes, I, I really feel that that's, that's blurred now. And I think, um, you know, the earth, uh, there's that incredible book about the earth without us. Yeah. And how fast it reclaimed. I mean, we've we've seen that in action with uh, with COVID, mm -hmm. how things kind of changed once the traffic stopped, you know, and, and people were not part of the landscape as much as they were. Nature comes back and takes over. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a few more major environmental disasters away from uh, erasing ourselves. That's a perfect happy poet note to end on. Yeah, happy depressing. <laughs> so we can go back and talk about how we're not depressed. <laughs> now, now I actually am. <laughs> and now's when I say, please come to my office. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, how that's how I cracked you open. I could see so much and feel so much of that chaos in, in these piece in these last two. There was so much movement everything was on the move. You know, every, all the animals were on the move and all the animals were adapting in different ways to different environments. And um, it just, the, all of the five that you read really, I, I think that they're poems for our times. They're just so 
so insightful and astute. Yeah, and, it, and interestingly, they as you know, they all had crows. Some they of them have crows. Yeah. You know, but only only one of them is really about crow. Two of them are about crows. The rest of them, they as they say, they fly through. Which they do. So, yeah. Uh, should we see? Are there any questions? Yeah. From from anybody listening, did did were there any sent in? I haven't seen any questions. I've just seen people have liked it, which is always nice. Yeah, I'll just jump in to say that uh, if anybody does want to throw any questions into the chat, feel free, and I can sort of read them to to both of you if that sounds good. If anybody has any questions, oh, we're, we're running still... pretty close to time anyway. Yeah. So we have time for a couple of questions. Well, thank if you. If you have yeah. them, sure. A lot of love in the chat. I'll say that. Yeah, <laughs> really nice. Yeah, well, well we, we, had a, we had a fun to pay people to say nice things. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like the greatest thing to be able to share the work. You know, and and as a writer, you're not like hanging up, you know, hanging over people's heads while they're reading. So you have no idea. So the opportunity to read out loud and be be in that space with others is really um, meaningful. We do have a few questions popping in here. Um, the first one, uh, Lorraine, would would you mind saying again how you came up with the the Raven? That's from Lisa. It was really just a um, just intuitive from what's around in my backyard, which is just tons and tons of ravens after failing at trying to bring in like a ghost character that looked like my dad that had kind of that energy. And um, it was it was just sort of like, oh, what if I tried this? And and it clicked. Um, Judy's wondering if uh, 1984 inspired the poem Animal Planet. Jim. No, maybe Animal Farm. Uh no, you know, it, it, there was a run of things that I remember reading about where trainers were getting killed by animals. And I just started thinking, you know, we're really such fragile creatures ourselves. You know, you think of riding a horse, this giant beast with all the muscles that could crush us so easily or elephants or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I think about how people um, disrespect nature and animals at their own peril. And if it wouldn't take much, a little genetic modification for animals to kind of say, hey, wait a minute, well, I don't need this guy on my back. You know, I, you know so yeah, I, I think that that's part of it, you know. Great, thank you. Um... The question from Oksana Lorraine, what was the process of uh, writing the book? How many years? Um, I was diagnosed in 2017 um, and I finished the book in 20, end of 2018 um, and sold it in 2019. So um, just, you know, just a year, because there was a, there was about I don't know, three or four months where I couldn't write anything and I was, I was sick and, um, and then I thought I wouldn't write anything ever again. And so there was that, but once it, once it kind of, kind of connected, I kind of felt like everything I've written in my entire life up to this point made it to where this could come. So it, it, it really did feel more like, more like that once it once, and I've never written anything so quick. That's this long. You know, it's a book length thing this long and and I really feel like I had been writing it for 50 years and and once I found the way to express it it was able to come out great thank you um we have a a question from Jeanette that I think she's uh rephrased a little um I think it's for for um Jim <coughs> Um, did you select the line then write the poem or would you write a poem and let the song line emerge um, no, well, this was a, a, a 10 poem sequence. And as I, as I mentioned, it has lots of, of like references to movies in particular and, and songs, you know, you know, songs that we all grew up with, rock songs and so on. And this particular one had the blues song. So no, um, actually, I, these are all songs I, I, 
I, these are lines I love from from songs like I ordered coffee, but the blues poured me misery, you know, and and I like the songs themselves. In fact, at the back of the of memory and rain, um, there's a list of all the songs and, and movies that are meant that are referenced in, in here, you know, Sunset Boulevard and so on. So, yeah, I, I, I actually plugged in the song lyrics where I felt they they should go. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, I think we have one final question from Caleb. Uh, Lorraine, was it hard to talk about yourself through your father's eyes? How are you so confident with his vision of you? Um, yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Yeah, it, um, it was really hard and also like the easiest thing ever, um, which is not a great answer, but I, how I was confident about it is I have a bunch of letters. He was a letter writer. And so he, I have just boxes of letters that he wrote to me over, um, over the years that I that I had him. And then when my grandmother died, she sent uh, my aunt sent a box of letters that my dad had written to her. So I had a bunch of different perspectives of um, of growing up and you know things that I wouldn't have um, have known. And my mom is still alive, so I was able to ask questions, you know, about that. And and then my own memory, which is certainly you know, I'm not saying is 100% accurate, but there was that that, you know, filtered in there as well. And I, and I guess the one thing that I, that I am confident in is I know that he loved me and um, that he was frustrated that he was so sick. And I knew that I, um, when I got sick, that was when I, I, I think I realized for the first time how hard it must have been for him to have been so sick for so long and to know that he would be most likely leaving behind young children and a family and what what that what that would be like to to live with and, and I was not that sick but it 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 raised so many more things I wanted to be able to say so I just gave myself permission to have the conversation that I, I can't actually have. Great thank you Lorraine and yeah great great question as well um, so I think that's all we have uh, time for. Um, I just uh, want to thank you both for, um, for this incredible reading and conversation. I want to say two other things to our audience as well. Um, again, please do consider making a donation to Beyond Baroque to supporting the programming we do. Um, you know, maybe Angeline can drop the link in the chat one more time to our donation page. Thanks, Angeline. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge help to us. Um, but even more important than that, uh, you know, please do um, both buy both Jim and, and Lorraine's uh, books, uh, certainly Jim's when it's available uh, in the not too distant future. Um, and then, you know, Lorraine's, go ahead and get it now. Um, but thank you so much uh, to everyone for coming. Uh, thanks again to Angeline uh, Keck for, for running things on, on the back end for us. And thanks especially to you, Lorraine, and you, Jim, for the reading and the conversation. Oh, great. It was wonderful to be here and great to read with Lorraine. Was, yeah, we've never read together really. It was uh, all this time. Yeah. And I think they work together really well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. And uh, hopefully see many of you soon on Zoom or uh, in person at Beyond Baroque next month. Take care.